Hello and welcome to the 20th episode of the Buddy Podcast. I'm your host, Buddy Lindsay. And today we're going to talk about part two of taking care of chickens and going over the basics of that. But before that, if you haven't visited the website and signed up for our email newsletter, please feel free to do so at budiy.net. Just go there and there'll be a sign up form on the front page. So with that, let's jump into the first segment of what's going on around here. Well, the good news is I got my saw stop set up and uh, I've actually started working on the video, actually like editing the video for that and try, so I could do kind of a comprehensive video because uh, I, I found a lot of videos setting up the saw stop, but they were all basically like pointing a, like from a distance and you just kind of watch and see what's going on. Not really anything getting in there and trying to go through stuff. So my hope is to make a video that kind of gets in there a little more uh, showing what to do to set up the saw stop. and. I'll tell you, I I took over a hundred, a little over a hundred videos, um, anywhere from you know twenty seconds to twenty minutes. And anyway, when I dropped all the clips that I think are necessary for it, I'm at about an hour and fifty minutes before doing any editing. So it's going to take me a while, but hey, it's there and it's getting started. With that, uh, since I have the saw stop up and running, I actually started the next project in the weekend woodworker course, and that is the Sonoma coffee table and they're actually modifying it to be for my girls and that's actually going really well I'm super excited about that and uh, where that's going to go and I will say it was really nice having the outfeed table uh, properly and the saw stop and being able to do some rip cuts long rip cuts for the aprons of the table I think everything is fairly dialed in at this point on the saw stop I probably need to do a few more checks just to make for sure that everything is going good but uh, I think I think it's going to do a really good job, and I'm super excited to get on to some more future projects. Probably need to do some more tweaking and dialing in as, as time goes on, but uh, I think I'm getting there. I also got a straight edge, a 50-inch straight edge, Veritas straight edge, uh, to help me not only get flat on the table saw, but to also dial in my jointer as well. So I'm hoping to actually get to that this week or maybe next week. We'll see how things go. So on that, let's jump into our main topic, and that is taking care of chickens. Uh, last week, I covered actually getting the chickens, where, who, what, where, when, and how, and then I went into you know getting them in the brooder for the first time, and all the things you need to know pertaining to that. The one thing I did leave out on the brooder setup is once you get your chicks and you put them in the brooder for the first time, uh, and also if you can, uh, putting them out on pasture for the first time, which I'll get into today, is uh, dip their beaks in the water when you first get in there. It gets a little water in their beak. They know where the water is, and they'll start drinking after that and start eating after that. That kind of signifies that, hey, we need to do this now. I left that out last week, and I was uh, super frustrated that I did. So with that, let's go into the last two two pieces to taking care of chickens. And the first one is the actual transition from the brooder that we discussed last week and onto pasture or into a coop. So the question is, when do you want to do that? Well, uh, there's a lot of factors to take into consideration. Uh, if you're doing it in the summer and it's going to be warm, uh, you can bring them out a little bit sooner, uh, especially if you're not you know, getting a lot of rains or you know, cold snap. The general idea is if they're meat chickens, then you probably want to bring them out their Cornish cross at about three weeks of age. So that way they can spend the next five weeks on pasture and uh, eating up all the bugs and the grass and you know, other stuff like that. And you know they get all the goodness and so they are good wholesome chickens whenever uh, you're ready to process them. When it comes to laying hens, you're looking at probably five weeks area, sometimes maybe four, sometimes maybe six. The, the thing you're after there is they're more completely feathered out before you put them out on pasture so that they can survive whatever, whatever weather swings that are there. However, if it is going to be a warmer weather time, then uh, you could possibly move uh, each of those up by a week. I know some people, uh, whenever it's going to be like 90 degrees in July for most of the day, uh, they just they go ahead and put them out at two and a half weeks for the uh, meat chickens and like four weeks for the laying hens because there's not going to be dramatic enough of a weather swing to uh, cause any harm to the chickens. And that just gets them out there a little bit faster and gets them out there to be able to uh, chew and get, get good nutrients and basically live a chicken life, which is kind of the goal. We want the chicken to live the life that a chicken is supposed to live and uh, have a good, respectable life uh, for the entire... We're trying to be nice to our animals. We don't want to uh, put them in like a feedlot where they're in like, you know... 10 chickens in a, an 18 square inch area for their entire life 
and a, I'll get into a little bit more of that later. So with that, the best way to transition them, depending on you know where everything is placed, is to see if you can't just kind of open a door and kind of funnel them into whatever it is and let them do the work of getting there. Otherwise, you're going to put it, need to put them in some sort of container and carry them to whatever it is they're going to. It doesn't really you know kind of matter which one, but the least stress, if you can pull it off, is just kind of open the door and herd them to wherever they need to go. So on that we need to discuss also a little bit about their watering and feed. Uh, generally when they get out on pasture they're going to drink a lot of water. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to get a three gallon or five gallon container uh, depending on how many chickens you have. If you have like 30 chickens you're probably going to want to get like two three gallon containers or a three gallon and a five gallon uh, or something like that. We, we, or kind of the more you get the more water that you need and you're probably going to refresh that every day uh, or every other day and uh, to make sure that they have fresh water in there and they don't get a lot of gunk build up i live on a dirt road and unfortunately there's nothing stopping a lot of the dirt and so it just kind of flies and so i have to keep the the water clean fairly often to get all the gunk out of it plus they like to scratch chickens like to scratch which is great you know it's great for the soil great for them it's just what they do but sometimes they can scratch right next to the water and kick all that crap into the water and then it's super annoying to clean up. Uh, so you just want to make sure that you have plenty of water, uh, especially if you're doing kind of a free range or paddock shift system. If you're in a, uh, a chicken tractor where they're going to spend you know, the rest of their time in the chicken tractor moving across pasture, uh, one of the best things that you can do there is to actually get like a five gallon bucket with little water nipples on the bottom and uh, it takes a little bit to train the chickens to it but once they figure it out it's a great way for them to drink and it makes your life a lot easier uh, i i have not successfully trained them for very long to uh, drink from the water nipple thing so i have to uh, just carry a giant bucket of water in there every day uh, and, and transition that. It's kind of annoying, but it is what it is. So on the feed side of things, you have a couple of options. If you're going with, uh, if you're doing meat chickens, generally you can keep doing the the laying or the grower feed, uh, especially if you're doing the, the crumbles and you're doing more natural stuff. Uh, you can continue just with the layer feed for the entire eight weeks of their life. Uh, that's kind of what they're designed. They're gonna continue to grow. They're getting good high protein content and uh, it's just gonna be really good for them. Uh, then the same thing with the laying hens. If you want, you can do the entire first six months of their life until they get out uh, and start laying. You can do them with the grower or probably around six to eight weeks, you can transition them to, uh, they have grower and then they have starter feed and then they have another type called layer. Uh, so each have different amounts of protein and other uh, content in their, in their food. Uh, but in, in the beginning, you know, they'll need the grower feed, which is about 20 to 22 percent protein. Uh, and then they'll switch to a starter, which it depends on who you go with. It's anywhere from like 15 to 18 percent protein. And then when you get to the final layer feed uh, that you're going to give them once they start laying, uh, it's going to be like a 15, 16 percent protein uh, in the feed itself. However, if they're out eating bugs and other stuff, they're going to get more protein throughout the day. Uh, than they will just through the food that you have, plus depending on what you throw them from food scraps. Other things to consider on feed and how much to give them is it can really, really vary. What you want to do is uh, you just want to give them so uh, give them food and then watch how they react. Uh, generally with my chickens, I give them kind of a standard scoop that you would get at uh, Tractor Supply, and I give them two of those a day for my 15 chickens. And this seems to be doing, it seems to do well. They, they aren't going hungry, but it's also it kind of pushes them to go out and scratch and uh, find other stuff. It's not too much that they're getting lazy and they aren't going to run around and do what chickens do. Uh, so you kind of want to find a good balance. You can also supplement some of their, uh, their feed that you buy by giving them plenty of uh, scraps, either scraps from your table or uh, stuff that you don't use in your garden. You just kind of throw it over to them. Uh, if you're not going to use it and they'll eat that right up and so that's why it's actually not necessarily a bad idea to grow a little bit bigger of a garden than you'll use and then you can just throw extras uh, to the chickens uh, as you have them and it helps supplement and prolong the feed that you have another thing that you can do is you can actually ferment your feed and this will this will not only uh, add extra nutrients and probiotics and other things that are good for chickens but it'll make your chicken feed go longer I'll, I'll be honest, I have I did this for a little while and I, I stunk at it, like I just did not do a good job at fermenting the feed and so I kind of stopped 
uh, until I can, and I'm going to try again at some point. But basically the idea is you will get, uh, you'll take your feed, you'll put about half of it into a, uh, a bucket, a five gallon bucket, and then you'll pour water in that bucket so it's up above uh, the, the feed line. Um, I don't remember the proportions, this is something you're going to have to Google. And then you put a lid on it and let it sit in there for a few hours and it'll ferment. Um, if, you put, if you put the right amount of water in there, uh, it'll stay liquidy and it'll stay watery and it won't mold. My problem is I can never get the proportions right and so while you know it would like fill it up and all this other stuff, uh, it would get like a layer of scum mold on the top and I'm like, you know, it probably isn't harmful to the rest of the feed, but I was never 100% sure and I just never could get those proportions right and sometimes I'd put too much water in there and it wouldn't ferment right. I just, I had a hard time with it, but once you get it dialed in and I've seen several, usually everyone goes through the learning curve, once you get it dialed in, you can save up to 20% on uh, the feed that you uh, feed, you know, on your feed costs because it goes longer. Uh, because there's some feed that you would just lose out on that the water will help expand and uh, let let the chickens actually get to. Uh, again, I'm going to try it again someday, but it is an effective way to make your feed last longer, make, causing you uh, to spend less money, and it gives them uh, extra probiotics, uh, which is good for their gut. One of the other things that you might need to give your chickens is uh, calcium and grit. Uh, first on calcium, the easiest way to do calcium is uh, to save your eggshells and then crush them up into small little bitty pieces, don't go whole egg size, and, uh, and then just mix it in with their food every couple of days and give it back to the chickens and they'll eat it. And that gives them the calcium that they need so they have good strong uh, shells. Or you can go buy like oyster shells or something like that from the store and give that to them as well. It does the exact same thing. Uh, the other thing that again is grit that you might want to give them. Those are like little limestone rocks that you get. It. What that's going to do is they're going to eat those. It's going to what they need is going to go in their crop, and that's going to help grind up the food that they eat, and uh, helps them have good digestion. I don't know, you know, how often you should give it to them or not. Like I supposedly they should be able to find it on the ground. If so, if but if you're not letting them do free range or paddock shift, which I'll explain in a minute and other types of things where they, they get new ground all the time, uh, then you need to give them grit, especially if they're in a coop. Uh, but otherwise, uh, they should technically be able to find it, but I like to give them a little extra just to be on the safe side. Usually uh, once a week, I'll take a handful of grit that I bought at Tractor Supply and pop it in, in the food and be done with it. And I got a giant bag of grit and I feel like I haven't even touched it, so and I haven't really had any problems. From there, I mean, that's that's really all there is to transitioning from the brooder into the pasture. What you're gonna do is you're gonna go out and I'll discuss coops here in a minute and you're gonna let your chickens out of their coop, whatever kind it is in the morning. You'll double check their water and let them go. Just let them have their day and they'll figure it out from, the, from there. Uh, it's just like all of us, food and water. And then at the middle of the day, latter part of the day, if you can do it, go out, check the coop, get the eggs if they're laying hens. And uh, so that way they don't get into them, and potentially break them and start eating them. We had a rooster that was doing that. And then at night, sometime after dark or right around dark, depending on when, you go out there and close them up in the coop so that you make sure no predators get in late, late at night. Next morning, do it all again. some point, you can either... Uh, get the eggs in the afternoon or get the eggs the next morning. Just just depends on how you do things. Generally, I recommend getting eggs in the afternoon. Uh, so that way they're, they're still clean, uh, freshly out of the chicken. Sometimes they, they like to sleep in their nesting boxes, even though that's discouraged. Uh, and sometimes they'll poop on the eggs and then kind of rub it on the eggs and it gets kind of annoying and frustrating. Uh, so if you can get them in the middle of the afternoon, you're a lot better off uh, if possible. Or if, you know, when you get home from work before dark, uh, something like that. Uh, otherwise, just get them first thing in the morning and just deal with what you have. So next, let's go to actually dealing with uh, coops. And this is kind of where do you put your chickens at night or during the day or whenever. Uh, there's kind of a couple of different ways that people generally go about it. Is One is they have a stationary coop that stays in the exact same place all the time. Sometimes they have a semi-movable coop where they'll put them in a coop and they maybe move it once or twice a year. 
And then you can go to the other side where you're moving that coop, you know, once a week, every other week, or once a day, depending on what you're doing. And that way your chickens get fresh grass all the time. And then inside of that, there's also a paddock shift method or free range or whatever. It just, it really, really depends on, on what you're doing. Uh, first, let's start with the stationary coop and run. This is the kind of the quintessential. This is when people talk about chickens and you see pictures of coops. This is generally what you see. It's an area where they go into at night and they have a long fenced in run that's kind of surrounded by uh, hardware cloth all the way around. And that's kind of where the chickens live for their entire life. If you have the space, uh, then this is a way to go. And uh, it's a way, you know, you can have chickens, you can have fresh eggs and you can have everything and you know they're not going to get hit by predators per se because they're going to be in a in a closed in area you just want to make sure that your run is large enough for all of your chickens that they're not going to get bored because if they get bored they start getting aggressive towards each other and so you just need to make sure it's big enough i don't know the right size that's something you might have to research i don't necessarily personally do a coop and run uh, so it's not something i can speak to very well another thing that i've seen people do is they do a coop and run and combined with free range so they'll have a coop with either the same size run or a smaller run but they'll actually let them out of the coop during the day and they'll just free range around the yard uh, depending on where you are all day and then they'll go back into the coop at night it really just depends uh, some of the key features that you want in a coop and for the most part this uh, translates over to mobile coops as well is you want enough space for each chicken uh, to kind of live their life um, i think i read you want like four cubic feet or four four square feet per chicken if you have what i recommend is the uh the rhode island red uh, this is enough space for them kind of in a sense permanently to live in and they're not going to get too aggressive towards the other chickens and they're going to start pecking at people and, and and other chickens as well because they're stressed out because they're such a small space and then from there you know we need to deal with nesting boxes as well and generally the recommendation on that is about every five or six chickens have a nesting box uh, so that there's plenty for them to get to depending on the amount you have and there's not going to be overcrowding uh, you also don't want too many nesting boxes because they aren't going to transition through the nesting boxes quick enough and you might have a hen that gets broody uh, which basically means they want to try to hatch some eggs and uh, they can get super aggressive uh, when they're like that and you just have to break you'll have to pull them out of that uh, coop for a while put them in like a cage like a dog cage for a few days uh, to break them of their broodiness and then you can put them back in basically when they're no longer aggressive towards people they they're broken of being broody and they're good to go back into the general population. So those are some kind of key principles around doing a stationary coop, uh, if you're especially with laying hens. So let's say you want to actually let your chickens out on pasture and do things on pasture. There's actually multiple ways to do this. Uh, one is you can free range. You can just open up the coop and let them run, uh, depending on you know your availability of when you can do this, uh, the the relative safety for the chickens, uh, things like that. Uh, this is a great option if you have if you have the space and you're not necessarily concerned about where or how far away they'll go Then you can do this the the downside is if you're close to your house the chickens are gonna know Where you live and they're gonna hang out at your house and poop all over your uh, Poop all over your stuff because they're like hey, this is where the human that gives us food is at we're gonna stay up by this area However, if you're out in a field and they don't necessarily know where you where you go, they just see you leave off and they don't see where you live, uh, they're going to stay within like 100 yards or so, uh, usually less, of their coop, uh, wherever that is, and that's just what that's how they're going to live their life. And the, they can do whatever they want, whenever they want, wherever they want. So let's say you don't have enough land uh, area to be able to free range your chickens. There's another couple of options that you can do. Uh, one of them is you can do a chicken tractor. Uh, this is especially good for meat uh, chickens, but you can do it with your laying hens as well. And that is you will build a, an enclosed area uh, that has lots of airflow and everything. My favorite chicken tractor is John Suskovich's uh, tractor. It's it's an easy chicken tractor to build and use. Basically, it has a, a door that you can walk into. You do everything out and you just pull it once a day. Uh, to the new area that you want to be. It's built so that you can have about 30 meat chickens in there and probably like 10-ish laying hens as long as you can do some nesting boxes in there. And you just kind of go out there every day, you double, you know, add food and double check the water and then you pick up a rope and 
uh, pull the pull the thing to the next little spot of grass and that way the chickens have fresh grass and fresh bugs every single day and you're working your land in that little spot all the time and the chickens love it uh, they have a lot of they have a good time in there another thing that you can do is you can do what's called like a paddock shift system and that's where you have different areas uh, that you have roped off that you want to do or uh, uh, fenced off that you want the chickens to actually do stuff in and whatever interval you do is you will move the coop into that other area uh, for them to graze and uh, deal with in different you know time frames depending on what you want uh, it's called paddock shift each area is a paddock and this is great especially if you have designated areas that you want to uh, you want the animals to be in it's kind of a mix between the chicken tractor and the uh, and free range uh, another option in that is kind of what i do and that is a a mobile coop uh, called the chick shop by Justin Rhodes and I have an electric net and I just kind of move them around my yard all year long uh, every couple of weeks I will in the morning before I go out I'll pick up the electric netting and I'll move it over uh, to another area I'll move the chicken coop uh, the chick shaw into that area and then I'll let them out and let them go for two weeks in that area and then do it again and it'll just keep moving. I don't have a designated area to do kind of the paddock shift system because I'm trying to figure out the best place to go, like the best area. Like this year I'm trying over by some trees during the summer so that for at least half of the day, hopefully uh, during the hottest part of the day, uh, they'll have shade throughout the rest of you know the afternoon. Uh, I'm going to see how that goes. Uh, last year I didn't actually think to do that and so I didn't do that. They were kind of in the sun all the time, but they did have shade from their chickshaw that they would get under and kind of hang out under and really when it comes to mobile chicken coops there are all kinds of things that you can do and all kinds of designs and it's actually a lot of fun to kind of research and kind of find that best design uh, that you can find i just really like the uh, the chick shaw because it gets the chickens up off of the ground year round uh, they they poop through great in the bottom uh, they have uh, bars that they can kind of you know sit on inside of the thing so their their feet aren't always on the hardware cloth because uh, they like to grab on to uh, sticks and wood and you know the poop just goes to the ground offers fertilization and they're only in there during the night or whenever they're uh, laying eggs it's just it's a great little system so really with all of that that is kind of the overview between last episode and this episode of how to get started getting uh, chickens and working with chickens Hopefully it provides you, in all honesty, it should provide you enough information to go get started and to order your first chicks and you know kind of go down that path. Uh, there's definitely some areas to fill in that you'll want to Google, especially when it comes to uh, what size and how big of a coop that you want to get or what kind of design that you want. That's really you know kind of a personal choice. If if I was to tell you what I recommend that you do, I would recommend if you're doing meat birds to get the John Suskovich style. Uh, chicken tractor build that one don't worry about anything else uh, there's a lot of other options uh, and then I would also recommend if you're going to do a paddock shift or do movable you know coop I would recommend looking up Justin Rhodes and getting his chick saw plans uh, and building that those are the two that I recommend on there uh, from there if you want to do a coop and run I would go check out April Wilkerson uh, she did a coop a few years ago I think three years ago uh, for a neighbor and I would recommend that one because it's more of a traditional style coop and run that's really big big run uh, or she does have her the one she built for her house that's a little bit smaller of a coop and run but she also uses that for free range so those are really the recommendations those are those are five different types of coops that I recommend uh, dealing with with your uh, chickens and it don't I wouldn't necessarily worry about you know all the other options that you have unless you just really want to go research you know Anna White has a good set of plans uh, on her website for uh, chicken coops and but they're all over the place be visit backyard chickens and go to their images section and look for coops if you want to do that uh, but those are those are kind of my recommendations to get started uh, the John Suskovich style chicken tractor or Justin Rhodes is uh, chick shaw and April Wilkerson has two separate types of coop and runs. Those are my recommendations. So on that, I hope you consider getting some chickens and uh, investing some time and, and some money into it and uh, having a good time because it's great for it's great for you, it's great for your family, it's also really great for kids because they have a lot of fun with chickens. I know my girls love them. So on that note, let's finish up the episode with my failure of the week. 
and that's going to be revolving around chickens and that'll be i had to uh get rid of a chicken i had to get rid of my rooster specifically i kind of i didn't necessarily want any, a rooster whenever i first got uh, chickens uh, however there's like a 90 percent success rate from the uh the hatcheries that they guarantee like a 97 percent success rate for uh, sexing the chicks so that you only get female chicks well i just happened to get a uh, a rooster in that you know, it, it happens. Uh, and so I was like, you know, what? we'll keep the rooster. Roosters can be good for protection and other stuff. Well, sometimes they get a little too aggressive and they start doing things that you want, don't want to do. Uh, in, in our case, the rooster was getting a little too aggressive. I didn't want that. And also was breaking eggs and eating the eggs. And definitely don't want that because there were days that I would go out there and there's only four eggs when there should be 11 to 14 eggs. And I just like that. I ain't spending that much money. And that much time to only get four eggs a day uh, when our family can eat uh, eight to nine eggs a day and that's just not going to work out so because of those two reasons i went ahead and uh, got rid of the rooster i probably should have done it sooner uh, but i was didn't want to put down a rooster I didn't want to get rid of the rooster i liked the rooster rooster was fun the rooster was interesting but uh because i waited so long um the, the rooster was just getting more and more aggressive and I just I couldn't handle it uh, and I think that was some of the reason that he was breaking the eggs as well so my mistake is I waited too late my other mistake is I missed the carotid artery on the uh, on the chicken and uh, so unfortunately it took the chicken a little bit longer uh, to to pass out than I think is uh, is what it should because normally if you hit the carotid artery properly uh, they should basically go to sleep and not realize anything has happened because uh, what you do is you put them upside down in a cone there's compression from the cone um, so it kind of gets them in, in a womb like situation so they get really comfortable and they get really like groggy and sleepy and then you cut the carotid artery and the the blood comes out so that uh, they never know anything happened and I feel really bad with that that didn't come out right uh, uh, with the rooster um, but I got the rooster taken care of, and that's just life sometimes. Uh, hopefully, I don't have to do that with any of the other chickens. So yeah, that was that was my mistake of the week. So on that note, please feel free to visit the website at budiy.net. You can go through the archive of episodes there. You can subscribe to us on all major podcasting platforms, or if you like to be on YouTube, we're at on YouTube. Uh, just search for budiy and i'll be there and you can hit subscribe on there as well to be notified when new episodes are released i thank you for your time i thank you for your attention and please definitely try to check out getting some chickens they're a lot of fun so on that note have a great day